hello everyone. We are here from Exa Bootcamp. I'm bringing you Ruben, uh, who's going to sh share his knowledge in just a few um, moments when I'm finished with introducing Exa Bootcamp to you. And uh, you will also get all MIT Reality Hack participants also get some later today access to a scholarship application form, um, which we are basically doing to, yeah, to help you to support you on your learning journey to become professional XR developers. And yeah, we've already done lots of open sessions together with many, many different experts. I'm also inviting you to check out our um, Exa Bootcamp YouTube channel where we are uploading most of our sessions if you want to learn more. And yeah, we've, we've already um, been teaching via AR since 2020. Back then, we have a very large XR developer community and a Discord channel as well. I would also invite you to join there if you have any questions about via AR development. There's um, over 2,400 developers there which can always answer your questions. And um, we will also share this invite link in the, um, yeah, in the Zoom chat. And yeah, if you're interested in basically taking a course to learn via AR, uh, we have uh, courses from beginner level to advanced level. So if you really don't have any previous knowledge yet, feel free to check our Excel Foundations Bootcamp. Um, the Excel Prototyping Bootcamp is when you already have some experience, but you really just need a great portfolio and some professional development and team experience, which you can have there. And then of course, there's very specialized courses for AR interactions, for rendering up optimizations and for mixed reality and HoloLens development. So yeah, also like if you're really in the beginning, um, we've released a free C Sharp course for Unity and that's also all on our website if you want to go and check it out. Um, yeah, our students are um, very, very happy with us. We also have a trust pilot profile if you want to read some reviews and everyone and we're proud of that is always very happy with what we are teaching and how we are teaching it. And yeah, our alumni are coming from very big companies. And that's also our advantage because we are offering advanced level courses. And our advanced level courses are visited by, are taken by advanced level developers from many, many companies, which are also actively hiring from our beginner level courses. So that's always a great opportunity. Um, yeah, Fehan, do you want to say something about XR Foundations, XR Prototyping, or should we directly switch yeah. over to Ruben? Maybe one more minute. I can very quickly mention about especially this interaction SDK as well. So basically, we have a two plus two months program for those who really want to get the whole prototyping skills. We are teaching two months pro foundations uh, knowledge. Uh, Unity, uh, VR development, uh, and the coding skills, and on top of that, two months of prototyping, which, which you can see that actually like a MIT a reality hack, but happening for the two months program with every week sprints and uh, lots of stand-ups as if like you are being part of a professional uh, XR studio, uh, either enterprise app or game studio. So we actually uh, released a interaction SDK comparison for those who would like to create uh, some interactive uh, experiences for UI and UX. So uh, this is something that we will also share uh, on the Discord channel and in Zoom link as well. So you can definitely uh, check it out before you start your project. So we wish you good luck with all these hacking journey. Uh, if you, I think a few more uh, small um, housekeeping items that let me share as well. Maybe Rahel, you can uh, go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, if you want to check the, the projects being created by the students and our trainers, you can also check the um, our YouTube page. And these are the programs that you can apply to, um, to scholarship. So all these details in our website, so I will not go so much into detail. Today, we will go deep in the rendering optimization and Ruben is our uh, actually trainer of the rendering optimization for standalone XR devices class. And today he will also give us a sneak peek of what uh, he is teaching during the class. We will focus on occlusion calling. Uh, Ruben actually created a um, um, a very nice um, training module for 20 minutes. We will actually be watching that together, but Ruben is live here. So we just want to make sure that his internet is letting us to, to directly um, stream from his Unity uh, project. So after 20 minutes, we will start getting questions. 
on any kind of um, optimization related stuff. You can even uh, also go to the checklist that Ruben is uh, already and maybe uh, sharing in the Zoom chat. So we would love to also talk about uh, beyond occlusion culling and we can talk more about the rendering optimization. And um, before starting, Ruben, would you like to share something or you already have an intro in the video? So should we start immediately? Uh, well, just to say that I recorded the video because I don't, you know, I'm pretty lucky that I have internet and electricity at all. I'm <laughs> just spending a few weeks here in Spain in a very weird uh, city. And uh, yeah, just I didn't want to risk or to take any risks, yeah. right? So I pre recorded the video and then the QA will be live. So that you know, we can uh, all ask your questions, and uh, that's it. Perfect. You can go over to the video. It is thirty minutes, not twenty. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. If okay. you want to speed it up, one point five x, I think that should also work. Perfect. Let's let's do that. So it will be easy. In the meantime, you can always submit your questions in the Q and A tab. We will be already looking or even answering some of these questions. So feel free to start submitting your questions on Zoom or on Discord. Okay, perfect. So let's start. All right, welcome to this lesson on occlusion calling for XR developers. So if you are here, that means that you are an awesome XR developer. Before I start, my name is Ruben. I am uh, the guy behind the game Guru and also behind the famous or not so famous, but secret hidden gem called Performance Task Force. But I hope that Ferhan did a good introduction already, so I don't need to do the heavy lifting right now. Just a small note, just bear in mind that I normally have a better setup than this shitty camera, only that I just needed to do some traveling, to do some optimization consulting work. And here I am with a very bad laptop, very bad webcam, and even worse, microphone. That's the price of being a freelancer, I assume. Anyway, let's get down to business. If you're here, it's because you are going to be extremely busy doing cool things, right? You are possibly doing a hackathon of 48 hours. And you know what? The last thing you should be doing is spending hours on these kind of lessons. That's why we are going to spend hopefully just a few minutes. Okay, when I say a few minutes, I say hopefully less than 60 minutes. You know, this ecological barrier of one hour. So let's talk about occlusion calling for XR developers. Okay, let's just get down to business. Let's get going. So the first question that I like to pose, that I would like to shoot directly at you the face is, why should you care about something called occlusion calling? And the reason is very simple. You as a developer have a budget. Right? A performance budget that, you know, uh, we could talk about loading times, we could talk about memory, we could talk about frame rates, all of these things. But if we are talking about occlusion column, we mainly care about reducing three things. One is the number of draw calls, second is to reduce the overdraw levels, and the third thing is triangle count or vertex count in general geometry complexity. In any game that you make, especially in VR or XR, you will have to fight these three variables, right? And one tool that is excellent to get rid of this is exactly occlusion calling. Yes, yes, as a very fast, uh, you know, a recap, draw calls is basically what issues, what, no, no, what unity issues to your GPU in order to tell, hey, please draw this thing, draw this cube, draw this stone, draw this character, everything, right? One object is generally one draw call, but that will be very expensive. So we have something called batching, right? To merge a lot of draw calls together. So that's maybe you can just have one draw call for drawing a thousand objects, okay? The other thing is overdraw, which is what happens when you just draw something and then you draw something after that on top of it, right? And, you know, all the time that you spent drawing this thing is wasted because you don't see it, right? You just drew after that, let's say, for example, a wall, and then all the time that you spend drawing this thing that's behind this wall, like a chair or something, is wasted on the GPU. That's overdraw. The third, the third thing is triangle count, vertex count. I don't have to explain, right? All of these things are expensive if you are dealing with XR development, right? Extremely expensive, especially if you're talking about mobile. 
And because this is expensive, we have to use tools like occlusion column. That's why you should care. Now, don't worry about that. We will explain, not we, I will explain what this is all about. So before we start with occlusion column, let's talk about column itself. Okay, so what is column? It is the subtle art of not giving up about invisible objects. Let's say that I am in a room uh, in my flight, right? and then there is another room, but the door is closed, and I have a chair in that room, right? Do I need to spend time drawing that chair? No, because I'm not seeing that, that right? it's in another room. Or let's say that I have, you know, I am looking at you, and then behind me there is a rogue, if you like, uh, RPG games, there's a rogue about to backstab me. I don't see it, right? Otherwise it would not be backstabbing. That's why I shouldn't waste any time rendering this rogue, because I don't see it, right? So by default, you know, we pay a lot of prices, right? We have a huge overhead of drawing every type of object, even if we do not see that. So Cullen is all about saying, I don't give a boop about all of these things because I don't see them, right? So in order to cope with this cost, we have two strategies. One is, let's call the objects, or let's forget about rendering the objects that are behind me. For example, that rogue, who is about to backstab me in the back? I guess that makes sense, right? If we think about that, it's out of my uh, cone of vision, out of my first term of vision. Then we call this frustum column. Okay, and that happens by default in Unity. You cannot really turn that off. Okay? Everything that is behind your camera is not going to be rendered. And that's actually a bit expensive to calculate. That's why Colin always takes a bit of time on the CPU. Now, the other strategy is to, you know, call or stop rendering the objects that are behind walls that we do not get to see. Like if there's a table in that other room and the room is closed and I don't see anything from that room, then I don't have to waste time drawing that table or the wall or whatever, right? So for that, we have something called occlusion column. And uh, for the description that I just gave you, it will be amazing to use for interiors, and also it will be amazing to use in VR. In VR, I say that because we tend to have, you know, like first person view. And when you have first person view, then many other things, uh, you know, can suddenly become invisible, right? Because we, we just don't have a huge uh, amount of view, right? We don't have a high degree of view with uh, VR. With third person uh, camera, this is a bit more complicated, but yeah, that's about it. Pulling all in all is about all about you know just stop caring about rendering the objects that we do not see. We don't want to waste that precious bandwidth, right? Especially memory bandwidth. That's column. First one column ha happens by default. You know the objects behind me, and a closing column does not happen by default because that is very expensive. Closing column is all about you know. Do not render what is behind other objects, right? Because I cannot see them. Again, occlusion calling does not happen by default because it's expensive. So that means that if you do not do anything about calling in general, you will still render the objects that are not visible, right? Behind walls and so on, right? So calling is now clear. What do we do about this? How do we uh, extract all the performance juice? out of OC, occlusion column. It is mm, simple, but can be hard, can be easy, it depends. It's just three steps. First thing is to go and set the static flags in the Unity editor. Let's actually, I'll tap to that. Sorry about my setup again. I am in my laptop. Hopefully I'm recording. Yes, I am recording still. So let's think about all of this from a more practical approach. Here we have this super nice environment called uh, sci-fi or something. Anyway, creepy cat, right? If you want to look at this environment, it's pretty cool. I use it every time in the performance task force to show a lot of the performance optimizations that people do not know about. Anyway, if we think about this scenario, this is quite perfect, right? It is an indoors scenario where, you know, in many occasions, we do not get to see objects that are behind walls, right? For example, if you look at the screen, and I'm not in the middle, you will see that we have some kind of room here, right? We were talking about rooms, and now we are talking again about it. And 
I'm showing you one room. So let's assume that this is one room. Right? Actually, this is not the best case scenario for occlusion calling, but let's assume that you know this is good enough. So we cannot spend one hour talking about this. If I'm here, okay, look at the screen. If I'm here, do you think about you know? Should we care about rendering this chair? Should we care about rendering these buttons? Should we care about rendering this uh, OLED TV? Actually, transparent OLED TV. This is a new thing, by the way. It exists. It's pretty cool. No, we should not care about that. However, if we do not know anything about all of this, it is going to you know, render the same. Actually, let me prove this to you. I'm going to go to the camera. I'm going to press Control alt f it is. And you are not here. Why not? There we go. It is not Control Alt. It is Control Shift F. Control Shift F. Now I am going to see through the camera this view, right? You see the, the game tab, right? All I see is a wall. However, uh, you know, uh, by default, I said we are rendering everything uh, that is inside this room. And we shouldn't do that, right? It sucks. Let me prove to you that this is the case, right? I am just going to open the tab window uh, panel again. Then I'm going to go to window, then uh, analysis, of course, and then frame debugger. Yep, this, this tool is going to let you see step by step uh, what we are going to uh, render from this scene, right? In, in terms of Unity. So let me go to big geometry. And we are, of course, using. Uh, okay, let's see. G buffer, the famous G buffer. Let's actually do it even easier for us. Let's go to the camera and say, I want to use the forward rendering path. Okay, it's going to be a bit easier for us. Now I'm going to disable the friend debugger. So you see that nothing really changed, right? We still have this here. Now we enable the friend debugger, and we are going to see step by step how we render these things. So we don't care about the depth pre-pass so far. We're just going to see uh, how these things are rendered. So let's see the opaque list. And here it is, the render forward. This is how I start to render these things. In fact, what I'm going to do is to change the key flags. So I just draw a solid color flag. So first we draw the terrain, which we of course do not care about because we don't see it from here. Then we start rendering uh, some walls and such. You see, this is the frame. And then on top of that, we see that we render a computer server. We render more doors, floor, roof, panels. Things that we do not really care about, right? Well, here the right we care about, but we will see eventually that we are also rendering things that are inside this room. Right? In fact, what I could also do is to do this script so it doesn't really bother me. I could go to play mode. And then if you see the stats window, we'll see that we have about 3,500 batches or draw calls. Are we looking at something that deserves to be punished so bad with 3.5k draw calls? No, I'm just looking at a stupid wall, right? In fact, we can even go further and get closer to the wall. And here, in theory, we could just draw one wall with one draw call. Two or three, okay, whatever, but not 3,000 draw calls. Why is this happening? happening because by default we do not use occlusion pulling. How nice. Now what do we do about this then? Well we do what I said we would do. Right? First we're going to say hey these objects are going to be set with the right static flags. Okay? We have mainly two static flags that we care about. Those are the occluder static and occlude static. As we are about to see do not worry if you don't get it right now. The second thing is that once we have set the static flags, we are going to bake occlusion column. And three, we're just going to see if this is working, right? So, so what are the static flags? First, we have the occluder static, and then we have the occlude static. The static flags is, uh, you know, whatever you find here under static. You see this static field on top right on the on the inspector. This is 
and telling Unity in which way these objects are going to be static. Static could mean it's not going to move. Static could mean I am going to use this for baking reflection probes. I'm going to use this for whatever, right? You have actually the list here. If you click here, you have all the options here. You can, for example, use it for uh, baking the left measures, all of these things. So we have here, as I promised, the two static flags that we care about. Occluder static, occludy static. So what are those? Occluder, yeah, just to leave it uh, there, again, is just something like a wall, right? Occluder is something that occludes other objects. Think of occluders as walls, okay? the walls of a room, things that occlude or cover or hide other objects because they are so big, they are so massive that, you know, they always take out of space and they tend to hide other objects, okay? Then the other one is the occludy static. Those are the chairs or the tables that tend be occluded by walls and other occluders, right? Again, I think that's the easiest way to think about these flags, occluder walls and occludy stones, buttons, monitors, TVs, whatever it is, small okay? Now, if you set the static flags right, you will be able to make occlusion column. So how do we do this? Well, first, you know, we could just make the perfect setup and say, okay, this is a wall, right? Nice. Okay, so if this is a wall, what I'm going to say is that this is going to be occluder static. Bam. But no, if we did test, then we would spend one hour. And I don't want to spend one hour, I don't have the time, and possibly I don't even have the battery to do a one hour video. What we're going to do is go to select everything, and I'm going to say, ah, occluder static, everything. And occluder static, everything. That's it. That's what 80% of the developers do. It is not correct for many reasons, but we could, you know, uh, start with this setup to see and learn how this works. I have set up the right static flex, all right? And what is the second step? To bake occlusion colon. How do we do this? Uh, actually, I did not put the first obvious thing is how do you access the the right panel. You have to go to, go to window, you have to go to rendering, and here you have a panel called occlusion colon. You see it here? Okay, so now that we have set the static flags, we have to go to the bake tab. And here we have three parameters smallest occluder, smallest hole, and back face threshold. Let's start with the easiest one back face threshold. We don't care about this for a 48 hours hackathon. I don't know if it's 48 hours or it's if it's a hackathon. I don't know. All I know is that you really have to get the most out of this lesson. So we're not going to care about it. This is just a memory optimization. It's the easiest one. And then we get to the real juice. Smallest occluder. This is the size of the smallest wall, right? Think of the smallest occluder as the output resolution of this occlusion calling algorithm. Okay? The smaller, the smaller it is, actually, I have to make it up. I wrote it here for you. The smaller that uh, this value is, the more memory usage that you will have in runtime, the more CPU cost is going to cost occlusion calling in runtime, and the more objects that you will be able to call while you to optimize. Okay? So if you have a huge resolution for this uh, voxel map, uh, because you set this to one, for example, you will be able to call or to stop drawing a lot of objects. However, the problem is that it will cost you a lot of CPU time and a lot of memory. Okay? If you go to my website, I have a blog post on a closing column, and I'm not just promoting this thing. I just want to show you one uh, nice graph that I have here. You see this, the smallest, uh, smallest occluder, if I set it to one, this is the cells that Unity, or rather Umbra, generates for me. However, if I move this uh, to uh, three meters, uh, I will go from 4.3 embytes to 0.8 embytes. But here you see the amount of cells that we have. It's just uh, you know fewer cells and then uh, fewer uh, resolution, smaller accuracy, right? This is one of the like possibly the most important parameter that you have to set. 
the default I believe is five. And we're saying that, hey, the smallest wall that can include another object is going to be five. Okay? That's the first uh, parameter. If you do not get it straight away, the definition of all of it, do not worry. Just play with this. This is my suggestion all the time. Do not get stuck trying to prefer, to, you know, to understand the perfect definition of things. Just play with it. That's always going to be uh, the biggest bang for your bank. Then we have the other option, which is the smallest hole, right? Think of that as the input resolution for your occlusion calling baking algorithm. If you set it to something that is very small, then you will have a lot of accuracy at the cost of more uh, of longer build times, right? For the baking parameters for the baking algorithm. And however, if you set it to something small, that means that it is, yeah, it is going to take more memory in the editor. It's also going to take you a longer baking time, but it's going to be more accurate, and you will have fewer errors. What's an error in this case? An error is when you stop rendering something that Unity thinks you shouldn't be seeing, but in fact, the real player should be able to see that, right? Yep. So for example, if I set this to 1000, whatever, uh, maybe Unity doesn't think that I can see the screen from here. And then it's suddenly, I wouldn't be able to see that as a player. This will be totally broken. I will probably just, uh, uninstall the game, but no, not uninstall the game. I will first possibly close the game, uh, give it a one-star review, and then uninstall it. Okay? It's not worth the space that it takes on the SSD. So start always with the normal and default uh, parameters that you see here. Once you're happy with some parameters, then just go ahead and click on Bake, okay? which we are going to do right now. You see this button called Bake? No, you don't, because I am always in the middle. So here it is. I'm going to click on back. Then I'm just going to have a drink. In the meantime, I really need a drink. No, I'm joking. I'm just going to wait here with you. Computing occlusion. If you think this is too slow, no problem. We're just playing. We are just trying to understand how this works. So what I'm going to do is to change the smallest occluder. Now, I'm going to change the smallest all to let's say 0 0.75 is input resolution. So we are going to click back again, computing occlusion. And then you should be able to see this here. You see here on the bottom right of the editor is a progress bar, and then possibly going to be slower as uh, Windows starting up. Let's give it some time. In the meantime, we can continue with the mind map. I'm still recording. Yes, I am. So, third step, once you have uh, done the question calling, is to answer the question, is this working at all? Is it this really work? Is this really working? And the way we check for wins is by using a combination of the stats panel and profiler plus the occlusion calling preview mode. Okay? Remember the 3,000 draw calls that we had before? Just check if we have fewer trocos than before, okay? than before we had occlusion calling. And now this is done. See this? It's totally done. Let's see the result of this. So if I drop the occlusion panel to the right, I could always say, okay, let's check the visualization, right? I go to the visualization tab, and then I do like this. And then I select the camera for which I want to check occlusion. And look. Here we are visualizing the effects of occlusion calling, right? For this specific camera that I'm touching here. And here with the scene view, we are able to see, you know, what is Unity actually rendering for this. So, you know, I said you can check this out, stats panel. So let's just play it and see the stats panel. Here we have, we have now 1000 batches instead of 3.5K or 3K or whatever, right? So I think that is a bit better. And if you paid attention to all of this, you will see that, of course, we also have fewer triangles, fewer vertices, and all of this. And, you know, everything is just working as usual, or should be, otherwise, check the baking parameters. Yeah? I could, in theory, just walk around and blah, blah, blah. How do I even walk, actually? That really doesn't really work. Okay. So that is all in all, all crucial claim. Right? If I 
disabled occlusion cooling, you will see again that this is, uh, again, super expensive. And that's why you should care about this as a XR developer, because you need performance and you cannot get that performance if we are talking about 3K trocals. That's crazy in VR, and especially if we're talking about uh, mobile VR. Right? All right, so problems with occlusion cooling, a lot. Yeah, we have to be honest, I don't have any reason to lie to you. We have many problems. First of all is the high CPU cost. You see, it is not uncommon for me to see projects where occlusion cooling takes only one millisecond, but sometimes I have even seen six, even 10 milliseconds per frame. That's a lot. If you are using Quest, that is more than the half of your budget. So that's no cool, okay? Now, if you have multiple cameras for whatever reason, then one trick that you can do about this is to disable occlusion calling on secondary cameras. Let's say I wanted to duplicate the number of cameras just for fun, you know, and we'll see that occlusion calling is possibly taking four times as the original amount in this case. So if you do something like this and you only need occlusion calling to be done in one camera, this is the case, you have to go to each camera and Disable occlusion cooling is going to save your butt. I tell you this because it saved my several times. So this is one flag that many people forget about, and then they come crying to me. Okay, and I have to just you know give them a, a few slaps on the on the back, so everything is fine. Remember the occlusion cooling flag in the camera. Turn that flag off unless you really need it, okay? especially in multi-camera setups. You only have one camera. Well, hope that you're making use of cushion cooling, otherwise don't take it. Okay. High CPU cost, okay? Now, if your cost is too high, then think of reducing, reducing what? The output baking resolution, which is gold, smallest, who knows this, who knows this? Anyone knows this? Smallest occluder. Actually, not reducing, but increasing that, increasing smallest occluder. The higher it is, the uh, less memory that we are going to take and the less CPU cost it's going to take. Another problem is memory cost. Now this is usually, you know, like one M byte, two M bytes, four M bytes, something like that. I don't think it's a huge deal, honestly, but you know, if it is, then you know what to do. Tweak the parameters and even play with the forbidden variable called back phase threshold, whatever. Let's get to the point. Hello, this, if you are using level of detail, then you have to answer this question. How is Unity going to know which model to use for testing for visibility? Well, Unity just said, okay, I'm just going to get the most detailed level. Okay? So if you have a 10K polygon theme as the most detailed level and another which is a cube, be careful with this because Unity will take the most detailed version of your LODs to bake visibility. So if one LOD level is a sphere and the other LOD level is a cube, hmm, that's going to give you problems, right? They have a different shape, so you have to be careful with that. Now, another problem is that, yeah, occlusion calling is expensive and it relies on baking. That's why we have tons of limitations on, you know, on the statics, right? So basically we can use a dynamic occludes for example, if we think of players, right? We can stop rendering players and players move, right? They cannot be static, uh, but we cannot have really dynamic occluders, things like that. So it is heavily static. The biggest problem for me, honestly, is the high CPU cost because sometimes it can take more than half of your CPU budgets if you're talking, uh, talking about VR and that's not cool. That's why there are alternatives. So I have a friend called Patrick Kulik. I know how to spell, uh, speak German, kind of. I've been living almost 10 years in Berlin. And uh, yeah, Patrick Koenig. And he developed a nice and super cool uh, asset called Perfect Cullen that I have bought myself. Yes, it is not affiliate thing. I just told you this is cool. Right? And the huge advantage of this is that it costs you almost nothing on the CPU. When I say nothing, I mean 0 0.01 millisecond. That is amazing, okay? So if you are really tight on CPU budgets, think about this plugin. Now, uh, already, 
before you buy anything, before you take your wallet and give the note to the wrong person instead of me, think about this. It also has more limitations because if Umbra, which is the solution from Unity, supported and I make Oculus, this plugin, uh, you know, it is not coming so clear uh, with these terms, right? It is mostly everything about static objects, but it is pixel perfect. So if this might be a good uh, fit for your application, think of this plugin. I have used it and I love it for this same reason. Yeah, it takes longer time to bake. Yeah, it takes also mem more memory in runtime, but dude, if we are paying just nothing for in CPU time, then, you know, all these this limitations, you know, uh, then I don't care about it. Then obviously, it depends on the project. Now, I have explained what occlusion colon is. Look at this mind map. You think about it. Okay? Occlusion colon is super helpful. Again, remember, when you have interiors and then also when you have VR, right? I don't care if you're doing prototypes on VR or something, it has to perform well. Because I, if, if I'm testing applications or games around, in VR, for example, I don't want to be throwing up or filling up buckets of vial every two experiences. I don't want that. Your app has to perform well. Therefore, you have to keep occlusion calling in mind. Right now, what do we do now? Four things, I think. Fly away and be free. Get uh, comfy with occlusion calling, of course, and uh, have fun with it. Rock your event with occlusion calling whenever it makes sense and. Normally, it is 95% of the cases, right? Second thing, grab my free Unity performance checklist, okay? The basic edition is free. If you want to upgrade, sure, be my guest. I don't care about the money. Just mentioning that it is a cool checklist where you can see, I don't know how many, over 100 performance tips that many people forget about while developing their games. And, you know, it just lets you, you know, just follow the tips and see if you just forgot about something obvious or something not so obvious. And then just by ticking a few things, you might go from 60 to 1000 FPS. I don't know. This might be the case. It has been the case for many companies and many of my clients. Right? If you really want to kick ass in terms of performance, then I have to say this, just join my Unity Performance Task Force. Just go to 3wsperformancetaskforce.com. This is a very nice place where I publish all the insider secrets of Unity performance optimization. Anyway, this talk is not about that. And I guess that otherwise, if I make it longer, then Fahrenheit is really going to kick my ass. So let's get to the Q&A. Let's go to the questions and answers, beer, water, whatever. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. And then, uh, uh, yeah, let's get to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, now we can thank to you also in person. So uh, we have actually a couple of questions, but before before taking this in the Q&A tab, uh, I would like to take the support of Ian for, for um, questions coming from the directly from the hackers because they have 48 hours to hack, so we have actually a little bit more priority for them before going to the other questions. Yes. So possibly to start out this QA, actually, can I, uh, I wanted to do this before, but I didn't get to it. Can I ask, has anybody made a hackathon project before, like made a Unity project in like 48 hours? Okay. Keep your hand up if you've made a Unity project in 48 hours that can run above 90 FPS. Yeah, me neither. Like I've made a, I've made a, I used to be a hacker here at this hackathon. Now I'm organizing it. Um, but uh, XR Bootcamp is, has, has a bunch of really good resources um, that can help you quickly optimize your projects. So uh, if you're it's not, if it is your first time building a project and you're going through and you're like, hey, oh, I made a, something really cool here, but I can only get 20 FPS. They have some really good information that can help get you up to running 72 hertz on Quest or 90 hertz on PC. Um, and we can share those resources as well as um, uh, the, the more information, uh, the, the occlusion calling information from this talk. So yeah. with that, is there anything else that we can answer questions on for performance? Uh, while we have Ruben here live. Yeah, definitely. I also shared the checklist, uh, that link, so you can download that as well. It will definitely help throughout your hacking uh, journey. But uh, if you have some burning questions, please let us know. 
maybe we can go deep beyond yep. the question calling. Go ahead. Sure. So maybe I'm not quite following completely, but it seemed like you were saying that occlusion calling is disabled by default because it's expensive, but then we're talking about how we want to use it because it makes it better performance or it's not as, as expensive. I think I heard the question. May I answer it? Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. The reason it's disabled is not because it's expensive. Maybe it's also the reason. The reason is that you have to configure how it works manually, right? You have to set the static flags. Unity does not know that for you, right? So it is just not configured by default, right? And yeah, on top of that is of course expensive and you do not always profit from occlusion calling. Like if I'm doing something like Fortnite, uh, I would just rip off the code uh, of occlusion calendar if I could, if I had access to the, the engine source. Not sure if that answers the question. I see, yes. Uh, okay, and then was there a difference between the dynamic occlusion calling and the static like when you said to turn off the dynamic one yeah so the thing you can turn off is per camera you can turn off occlusion cooling like the whole system because oh, yeah. otherwise you do use occlusion cooling per camera and i've seen projects where they had one camera just for ui rendering and i saw like three three hundred no, no, not 300 sorry just three or four milliseconds being spent on a camera which was just rendering ui and you know it was doing the full occlusion calling pass, even though we were just you know rendering the, the UI part. I see that makes sense. Thank you. Got a question? Yeah. Um, in the past, I don't know if they fixed this yet, but I, I when developing for the quest, especially just generally developing for mobile, um, using post processing effects has like a really severe impact on uh, frames per second generated for GPU. Do you know any kind of alternative solutions? That we can use to make effects like either chromatic aberration or bloom or anything like that um, that we would normally use the post processing stack for but we kind of can't because of mobile. yes uh in fact i i sent a link to one of my clients just last week there was um the ways to fake uh post processing effects which of course is not ever going to look like you know if you use the the real one. And just looking for a link at the same time. Uh, I think it's actually this one. I can put them in the Discord afterwards yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. And I will share the resources on Discord as well. So everybody has them. Yeah, I think I'm looking for a link from ARM, you know, ARM, the company. I, I, I talked to some of the guys there in uh, one Unite event. And there was, you know, they had like a library. I'm not sure if it's this one. In any case, I can look for that. They have like a section with different post-processing effects and how you can fake them. I think it's actually a different one. But for example, if you're talking about Bloom, right? We normally do this like in full screen and that's like, uh, it's actually just too expensive for mobile devices, right? Due to the amount of memory that it pushes, right? Every frame. So if you're looking to fake that, you can always add it like locally, right? In the fragment shader. It's not going to look good because it's not going to glow out of the boundaries of the object but you might be able to do some tricks so that it kind of looks like fake stuff right otherwise you can always add like a different layer to one specific object if you're looking just for um faking bloom in specific objects it depends basically like honestly it depends on the amount of resources that you have for faking these things right in a production game it might be really worth it spending time on doing this but getting it right while it's fake, it's really expensive, right? It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of tweaking and all of this, right? And the moment the artist changes something, you have to redo it maybe, so. All right. Uh, yes? Um, I was wondering if you're more in the multi like, what are some problems that you have to rely on? We have difficulty hearing, maybe Ian, you can quickly. Yes, so the question was, um, are there complications that occur with the implementing occlusion culling when it's a multiplayer Unity application? No, I, I, I haven't experienced any. I think you just have to be careful with the parameters. The worst thing that can happen is that you suddenly stop seeing things that you should, but that's normally easy to spot, right? If, especially if you have Q&A uh, and such. So just be careful with the parameters, play around with it. Yeah, don't spend days tweaking that before you know you are finished with the scene because sometimes I've seen 
many people, you know, just spending days finding the perfect settings for occlusion cooling and then production says, hey, let's change the layout of the level. Then they have to redo this again. And then they just waste time or even quit because they just get frustrated with this type of work. So just find some, you know, values that you like and stay with those until it's, you know, worth uh, tweaking them. And no, I don't have, I, I haven't seen problems with uh, multiplayer uh, so far. If you are talking about anything specifically, uh, maybe you can elaborate, but I haven't seen any. Mostly that works by, uh, you know, just stopping the rendering part of uh, the objects that's not disable scripts or something. Okay. Right. By the uh, way, I've, I found the optimization post. It's the second one I sent. Oh, the imposters. Yes. That's the, also the, the, po the post, sorry, the post for faking bloom and such. Oh, okay. Okay. I thought you meant imposters, like um, trying to save on, on police. Oh, sorry, we have eight minutes for our session. Do we have any more questions? Yes? Uh, yes, question. So when you said that the uh, opportunity is modulars, uh, what do you do if you have like a union hallway, right? That you could potentially see for, like if you want to occlude parts of that hallway, do you just like cut it into separate pieces? So like what portions of the hallway could other portions? And is there an advantage when you break it down because now there's a separate object and now each one is a separate rock hole and you know, like what is the, uh, what would you do in that situation? Uh, I don't know, for example, in your project, you had that window, right? So you could just proceed to piece through that window. Is that window not being, a, it's a separate piece that is not marked as an OPD, so you can still see stuff through that window? I only got fragments of that question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, that one's in the back. So the question is, so say you had a winding hallway um, that uh, you had a, a single piece winding hallway and you wanted to implement a cushion calling on it. Uh, would you need to take that hallway and break it up into pieces in order to properly implement it on there? Um, and then if you did, the concern is that they might run into errors with how... If you were to break in that hallway into pieces, would you make more draw calls? It would, so in breaking up that hallway in order to do occlusion calling, you would now introduce more draw calls that needed to be made on the hallway because now it's made, it's been separated into pieces. Yeah, it depends on the size of the studio and the resources that you can spend on doing these solutions, right? If it's a small studio, you don't have too much time. The best approach is to split the geometry as you need, um, enable static patching. And static patching is going to let you reduce the amount of draw calls that you have while making occlusion cooling work at the same time. Uh, and also frustrum cooling also works by default when you use a static patching in Unity. That's the shortest answer I can give you. If you have a larger studio, you can always, uh, uh, you know, implement custom solutions. And I have seen this, but you know, we're talking about studios with let's say over 200 people uh, working on a single game, right? Does that answer your question? Very close, okay. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> I yeah, there's a mic. I don't have that ready. Ah, so it's the, with implementing baking and occlusion culling, um, is there a recommended pipeline for the order in which you set those up because you can run into issues? Otherwise, like, I'm sorry, what was the, the order where you'll see the... So if you don't set up occlusion culling and baking in the right order, you might end up in a scenario where you would see the shadow of an object on the ground that was baked, uh, but the object is not being drawn itself. Yeah, that's a good one. I have not experienced that. It would be a surprising thing to see, but uh, I, I totally expect something like this to happen. I wouldn't be you know, like shocked or something. If you have experienced that, just drop me an email. I, I would be curious to see that. Um, I mean, I can send you my email or someone if you guys want to uh, keep in touch. I have experienced that myself, but uh, yeah, never say never. I hope I, I 
captured that closely. Um, Xer, so yeah. Um, other questions that we can do for four minutes? I have a question. Was my chat, my, my talk so boring that people are leaving? Uh, <laughs> I think they get what they want to. All right. Okay, let's let's quickly wrap up. Any other last questions? I mean, we will. Uh, I think uh, Ian, we can continue with Zoom, right? You will not need the Zoom for the next session. Um, the I have to double check the schedule, but I think we have another group coming in. Um, oh, oh, sorry, sorry can, we, can we can we at least uh, continue with the Zoom link? Yeah, because uh, I just want to make sure that uh, in Zoom chat we have multiple questions still. That's why. Yeah, yeah, we can continue in there. And if there's Zoom questions, we can do that for the next four. Sure, sure. But any anyone le left with without uh, like uh, answered questions? So I just want to make sure in the floor. Did you have a question? Uh, I can connect. Uh, I can like. Yeah. So um, for the event, uh, yes, XR Bootcamp. Um, I do recommend those classes. I've, they have some really cool stuff. They have, like I've made robotic twins of like ro digital twins of robot arms and stuff. But um, they are partnering to bring mentors and optimization resources. All of those will be available in the Discord. I'll upload those right after this. So um, look for and those. The recording of this class will be available in uh, one day. So you, they can also watch as well. So if there's anything. It'll be live tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And uh, one last thing that I would like to maybe mention, if you are interested on this optimization uh, stuff, um, with Ruben, we have actually a masterclass starting in three weeks. Uh, what we are doing there, uh, you are learning the techniques like you learned today, a little bit of occlusion calling. And afterwards, you are actually given like a project, a high uh, look, good looking project. And it is running at five frames per second. We ask you to bring it to 72 or at least like um, uh, 72 frames per second. Uh, we call it nightmare scenario. So you are actually learning while optimizing with us. So feel free to um, ping me on Discord uh, or uh, reach us through our website and Ruben will be happy to support you guys. Perfect. I think uh, we are good to go. Uh, we will continue, by the way, for those who are already in the Zoom, we will not, we are not forgetting your questions. We will continue that, but we will say goodbye to MIT, uh, hack, reality hack hackers so good luck with your uh, hacking journey and uh, we have a scholarship program by the way we are announcing i think at 7 p.m today so happy to see you actually uh, in one of our programs i hope that it will help the diversity and inclusion in the xr uh, creators community thank you Ferhan, uh for the presentation we do need to switch for our next panelist that's coming in okay. i'm sorry about okay. the time crunch okay no problem we will take over the zoom and then we will continue here okay just don't end the, end the session so just leave the session we will we will continue okay we'll leave okay uh, uh, thank you good to see you <laughs> good to see you thank you so much thank you see you, you. miss you already bye bye Okay, uh, let's continue. Uh, I hope that Ian will not end the session so we can continue. Um, we have on the Q&A tab, please please submit your questions on the Q&A tab because it's very difficult for us to, to really uh, follow the chat. So uh, Ruben, should I uh, read for you or would you like to select? By yourself? Uh, I can actually do that myself. Okay. So the first question is, anyone know what software he's using for his branching tree chart? Uh, yes, I tried a lot of different software, especially on the cloud, like on the browser. And the one that I liked the most so far was Xmind, Xmind 2021. I think it's called Xmind Cloud or something like this. Um, you know, it's not free, but maybe if you're a student, it is free. I don't know. Explains. Uh, actually, I will just write it down here. Explains. Okay, I'm, I'm also trying to find. So in the meantime, you can maybe skip to this next question. Yeah. So that's a solution, Colin. Hook into the same utility callbacks as Frustrum, Colin, like on became on become visible and such. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. 
normally these kind of questions, I might have them while I work, while I work in a project, but then I look it up directly or I do some tests on the spots because these kind of things also tend to change over time without warning. So, you know, I just learned to just look it up uh, whenever I need to, to know that. So can a wall be in a, an occludee, a static occludee, if it's behind another wall? Yes, absolutely, you can do that. Everything can be both an occludee and an occluder. Um, at the same time, or one or the other one, that's uh, that's fine. What was the number of CPO cost to avoid when using Quest? The number of CPU cost. Well, I I, I I'm not sure what you're actually talking about. Um, I assume that we are talking about the budget of CPU. I just seen projects where calling costs like ten milliseconds. That's that's more than fifty percent of your budget, right? On Quest. I will say that you should be aiming to not pay more than two milliseconds in cooling. And that includes both occlusion cooling and frustrum cooling. And frustrum cooling is already, you know, can cost you already one millisecond out of the two milliseconds. So, you know, this is very expensive. So that's why you should always be very careful with the parameters of occlusion cooling on the baking uh, thing, right? But if something was taking more than two milliseconds, maybe 1.5 milliseconds uh, on calling, I would uh, pay that a visit, right? This issue a visit. Uh, yes, actually, thanks for the session. May we get Ruben's mind map? That's a good reminder because I uploaded that just before this event. Perfect. So, so like a link, I, share the link. Yeah, I just. Putting a link to my blog post about closing calling, which I made Perfect. a year ago or something like that. Just at the end, like way back, way to the bottom is a link. I think this is like a sentence. Click yeah. here for the mind map, okay? Just click it there. Okay, would you advise to use this package? I guess that you mean the perfect calling package for a game that uses three cameras rendering at the same time in an open world. Oof, open world. You would need to test that out. Uh, in general, occlusion calling is not great for open worlds because there are so many, so few, so few occluders. Um, yeah, I think what I would do in your case is first to try the Unity's uh, built-in system from Umbra, Umbra Technologies. Uh, sounds like umbrella, um, umbrella corporation. Umbrella corporation. Yeah. <laughs> um, and see how it performs. If you think it helps you, Umbra, if uh, Umbra helps you, you see this, the profiler stats or the preview, then, you know, just check how much it costs in terms of CPU, CPU cost and, uh, you know, make the numbers. Uh, also look at the videos that, what's the videos that uh, Patrick Koenig uh, recorded, okay? Just to have a feeling. I spent maybe four hours before buying the package myself, investigating, right? But he's a cool guy, actually. He uh, he also uh, I, I am in contact with him on Discord, and he's very helpful. So, so how do you measure the frame rate while running the app on a mobile or headset? So many ways of doing that. It depends on the target platform. If you are using Quest, the easiest is to use uh, the Oculus Developer Hub, especially the last version. Uh, it gives you the, the performance metrics, right? If you are just using something else, just buy one of these uh, frame rate counters on the store. Be careful that it doesn't create too much garbage. They tend to do that uh, quite often to create garbage, to create the strings and such. But yeah, and otherwise just calculate it yourself by dividing one, uh, you know, just take one divided by time dot uh, delta time. Maybe, you, yeah, yeah. You can get crazy with that. Any info on Quest Space Warp tutorial? That's a funny one. I first came across that about three years ago or four years ago, but it was like totally early access, secret thing and such was not working very well. But I think they made a lot of progress. And this is one of the topics that I'm still investigating. So I have no strong opinion yet, or no solid opinion on that yet. Only that it can be very useful in very specific scenarios. So, yep, the hype is real. Perfect. So um, is there anyone here before we, we end up the, the, 
uh, session. Is there anyone who would like to directly even uh, talk and uh, ask questions in person? We can also give you the chance to talk or you can submit your questions. If not, we are about to uh, wrap it up. So, in person, someone's going to knock at the door yeah, here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least face to face, let's say. Right. Remotely face to face. Okay, any other last questions or uh, because we are already uh, over one hour. So I just want to make sure. Okay, great. So um, it looks like it. I mean, sorry, we couldn't go through the questions on the chat. I know that there were some questions there. I don't know if we can find it now because um, it's very difficult to, to find. But uh, if you have any questions, anyways, we will be on the uh, Discord server of um, XR Bootcamp. So feel free to uh, reach us there and our trainers would love to support you. Thank you everyone for joining us. I mean, Ruben, thanks for, for joining us today as well from a very difficult um, condition in terms of Wi-Fi, but I hope that uh, everyone can at least hear you and see you. Not maybe in the perfect resolution, but it's completely fine, right? As long as you 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 can give your knowledge to, to our, our community, it's amazing. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, uh, for the diversity inclusion, there is a scholarship program that will be announced at 7 p.m. ET uh, at the hackathon. This is only for the hackers joining to MIT hackathon. We have a special scholarship for underrepresented hackers. So uh, if you are already in the hackathon, I think the organization team will make the announcement on Discord and during the welcome uh, ceremony. Okay. Perfect. Thank you everyone for, for joining us today. And yeah, hope to see you in the, either in one of our uh, open lectures again or in one of our master classes. So uh, thanks Ruben for joining us today and giving your valuable knowledge and sharing with the rest of the uh, community. I wish you good luck, all the hackers at MIT. Anything you want to add Ruben before we leave? Uh, no, I just answered another question on the chat. How to optimize open world addressing with no walls, only natural landscapes. LODS and Fox, uh, not Fox, Fox. I think yeah. that's a typical sneaky way of optimizing these things. Perfect. It was fun. Thanks for inviting me. Thank um, you, Ruben, for your time. And yeah, hope to see you in the next session. So thank you, everyone. And have a very nice week ahead. And have a nice hackathon. Bye for now.